Welcome to Health Tech Hustle. We exist to share stories of the brave entrepreneurs helping to solve the most important problems in digital health today. We interview top leaders in health tech and bring them onto our show each week to listen and learn from their story. With your host, Rodney Hu, founder of 209 Digital. What's going on, everybody? Welcome to another episode of the Health Tech Hustle podcast. Today, we have a very special guest, Mr. Nathan Krishna. He is the assistant professor at the University of Maryland, Baltimore, and he is also the CEO and president of Psych Associates of Maryland and Bloom and Mind Health Tech. So without further ado, Nathan, welcome to the podcast. Well, thank you so much for inviting me to the podcast. And oh. I, it's an honor and a pleasure to be with your audience in these difficult times. Uh, hope to hope to uh, share my experience and, and hopefully inspire and, and get through these difficult times. Awesome. Well, let's jump right into it. Um, let's kind of just give us give a background on who you are, um, what you are doing, and how you got into the health tech space. Sure, sure, absolutely. Well, um, so I can. I'm probably. I think the best mechanism is to kind of go back in time, and uh, you know, I I am a, I'm from a small town in India called Mysore. I grew up there with my family, my dad, my mom, and two sisters. I um, finished my medical school, and, and in India, you have to. You know, you graduate, you get a, you're going to follow the herd, you've got to, you got to get into a post-graduation and get married and have kids and so forth. But, but you know, I, I was always restless. I did not want to conform to the, to the, uh, to the norm. So I, um, you know, reluctantly, I joined, uh, I, I joined to train in, in, in emergency medicine. I, I joined a, a hospital, regional hospital, where I was taking care of emergency situations. You know, people would come with a heart attack, a stroke, um, a motor, motor vehicle accidents, and so forth. And, you know, my life was fine. It was algorithmic. I would, I would stabilize them, call the specialist, and, and they would go off to the specialist's uh, care. And and it was fine. However, one night I was taking care of a motor vehicle accident. Uh, I was suturing a young kid and I was exhausted. It was, I think, three in the morning and I was walking towards my door, my room, and I saw like a a, a group of people, about 100 people holding a man down. And my first instinct was to turn away and run because, you know, it seemed like a very uh, hostile, belligerent, uh, uh, kind of like a situation. So... Uh, somebody noticed that I was wearing, um, you know, the the white coat. They ran behind me and said, "We are waiting for you." And man, I was I was more scared than the client. I went there and I saw this, you know, a, a middle aged man being held by ten people, and he was really you know, staring at me, saying, "I am Lord Shiva." Uh, I don't know if you are familiar with Indian mythology. Lord Shiva is the is the is, the, is a is an incarnation of of of, of a god. Who's who's a destroyer, uh, end of life and spiritual life. So uh, I I you know but, but anyway so I took care of that patient despite my my um, uh, fear I took care of the patient but I was fascinated by by that I actually started believing that he he be, he believed that he was Lord Shiva. So I started following this client uh, consistently and I realized I was talking to my attending. He was telling me about neurochemicals and genes and how how this patient was affected by 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 genetics and not necessarily his life experience. It was so difficult for me to understand how can you conceptualize this person who believes in in himself being connected to God uh, uh, and break it down to genes. And he handed me a paper uh, by er- Erwin Gottesman about genetics of schizophrenia. Uh, and I read that paper and it just blew my mind. And and I followed that client. This guy was a 40-year-old man, had two kids. He was a revert teacher. However, every summer he would get manic and, and, and the town would tolerate him because, you know, they knew him. He was a teacher. He was a good guy. This specific night, they couldn't tolerate him because he was broke because he couldn't go to work. So God told him he could go to the temple and grab the gold. So then that's when the priest and the pastor said, uh-uh, no, you can't, we can't tolerate this anymore. And they brought him to me. 
that weekend i quit my job and and, uh, and 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 applied for a research position in national institute of mental health and neuroscience in india and and my life in neuroscience began uh, i worked very hard uh, was working in genetics of schizophrenia and got an opportunity to come to mass general to work with bob brown who was a professor at that time uh, he was uh, working on um, on lou gehrig's or als and i was uh, i was there to train on a genetic sequencing on, on a sample site on a sample in india uh, this was a population which had psychosis or mental illness in addition to lou gehrig's disease so i i uh, i i from that from that position i came to university of maryland i did research with uh, with a really famous uh, and a pop, uh, very um, uh, very um, the best uh, schizophrenia research uh, center called maryland psychiatric research center with gurus like dr will carpenter and, and guni thacker and bob buchanan um, however during that time i think the recession hit uh, it hit the entire uh, you know us and, and western economy so the research grant dried up so i jumped into getting trained as a, as a, a resident in psychiatry at university of maryland and then i finished my residency and i was offered a position as an assistant professor at university of maryland i loved it i i, I took that job uh, on a drop of a uh, of a hat and uh, i was teaching residents i was responsible to train uh, residency uh, students you know, doctors in training to be psychiatrists nursing students medical students loved it loved it loved the job but uh, you know 3 years into the job i felt a little restless i i jumped towards uh, public uh, private sector and i um, was started working with dr abdul malik who was the owner of psych associates of maryland which is uh, currently a company that i own now and an opportunity opened up and he said hey i am i am getting old i want to retire do you want to buy the practice and i i jumped i did not know what i was getting into <laughs> i i um i just i and my wife kept asking me are you sure are you sure what you're doing i said yes absolutely so i jumped in i bought the practice and i i realized uh, it was not easy you know my job at university was very simple you know i teach students and i go home and i you know my paycheck came but that when i took over this business that's when i really realized uh, running a business was was complex and fascinating but it every minute was challenging and and i loved it i loved it i still love it <laughs> uh, we grew the practice from about 8 prescribers and 12 therapists to currently we have and two locations uh, and i think the revenues were you know one point in you know, near 2 million dollars uh, i uh, you know infused capital i infused hard work uh, i worked 60 70 hours and and uh, today we are five location 25 prescribers uh, about 20 therapists we have state of the art treatment for depression called as transcranial magnetic stimulation uh, we offer in house treatment for patients uh, we offer a special treatment for autism behavior kids who are struggling with autism um, we also are providing the, the the ketamine or psychedelic treatment for nasal uh, for patients also struggling with depression so i think we are i think i consider ourselves as a as a as a center uh, comprehensive behavioral health center um so that's how i got into business and then i i i think a researcher am i am i going fast do you want me to stop or <laughs> no you're good i mean we could just do a quick recap on everything you just said cuz that was a lot of information sure. what i took from it is you are already a practicing physician in india and you've had one experience where you're kind of just thrown into an intense situation dealing with somebody hands on and that one experience kind of led you down the pathway of wanting to do more research into the psychiatric field and then one step one situation led to another and you came from yep. india over to the us and started making more connections learning more things and just started diving deeper into this industry absolutely absolutely the the that client that fascinated me was was a client who was struggling with bipolar disorder and and that illness still fascinates me it's an illness where a person can be normal 
but during specific times of the year they 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 become excessively energetic and really lose touch with reality there are a lot of famous uh, uh, instances where you know very very high net worth and successful people people get into a manic episode and destroy their life you know perfect example um i i've heard of is like you know uh, the famous uh, uh, you know uh, two and a half men actor who apparently supposedly had a manic episode and destroyed his career um so you know people who have bipolar can can be pretty normal at times but during these manic episodes they become completely uh, almost almost kind of like a, you know like a neurosis and then they come back to normalcy that that fascinates me how can somebody be normal most of the year but then they have this swing where they completely lose touch with reality and then deep uh, and and dive into a depression it's like emotionally and mentally volatile like absolutely Absolutely. They're on both ends of the spectrum, wide swinging. Yep, yep. Mm. So, um, yeah, I, I, um, you know, I, uh, I am a researcher. I think deep down inside, I recognize un, un, unidentified patterns, sequences, um, trends, and and you know, I, uh, I, I was working at University of Maryland. Um, I was uh, managing um, the psychiatric emergency service. I don't know if you're familiar with that. You go to an emergency room. say you have depression or want, you know say a client feels like he wants to kill himself so uh, the emergency doc usually uh, refers them to a psychiatric emergency service in larger uh, tertiary university centers so university of maryland had a um, psychiatric emergency service so i used to be the attending or the doctor in charge from 3 o'clock to 10 o'clock on friday nights and my god that was the worst shift <laughs> you can get because baltimore is university of maryland is, is right in the heart of baltimore right? like right bang in the middle you know where wire was shot and and you know a lot of uh, difficult situations have happened in baltimore city uh, so every friday we have the most number of patients who want to kill themselves uh, and my er gets flooded because it's not because they want to kill themselves it's just because they don't know how else to ask for help so i would ask my clients like why john why are you why do you feel like killing yourself and he would say dr krishna if i stay on the street i know i'll shoot myself uh, with heroin or something and kill myself i just need to get to rehab this is the only way i can get in that really like click the light in my head i'm like it's going through the emergency room that's yeah your- and it's really ridiculous they they wait I don't know if you ever been to an emergency room you spend half a day to get seen by a nurse another half a day to be seen by a doctor if you're lucky you get you get triaged into next level of care if you're not lucky you're stuck in the ER 2 3 days before you get to the next level of care so these patients go through these arduous difficult steps just to get to a rehab uh, and 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 that is true right you know in 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 cardiology and neurology there is a concept called as golden hour if you have a heart attack the the the, the standard of care is within an hour within 90 minutes or 60 minutes you if you can get to the hospital and get treatment you can salvage uh, you know you you will not get any complication or you will you will you will not lose heart um, you know if you have a block in the heart, heart vessels it won't uh, really uh, cause uh, your heart to have any structural destruction uh, similarly in psychiatry i feel it's a golden moment where a patient comes in and say i need help and you need to give the help now not put them on a wait list unfortunately current situation is that you have to call numbers you have to call doctors and you're put on wait list some places have 90 days 60 days 100 day wait list you think a patient can be depressed for 90 days just to be seen by a provider that's that's how the state of situation is so i really thought about the pain point i am i and my colleagues and everybody in this world is ready to put your social security your credit card on amazon and facebook but you don't have a system like that for mental health and healthcare so me and my um a couple of my family friends hooked up and we decided there has to be a marketplace there has to be a place where everybody all the stakeholders can put their request in a web browser or an app or a text message and somebody you know automatically 
uh, you know, the AI or, 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 or computer or software will, will match them with the resource. And when we did our due diligence, there was actually nothing available. And we started working on a platform called as VPARC or Virtual Patient Admitting and Referral System. And, and slowly we decided to form a company called as Blooming Mind Health Tech. Uh, we hope to leverage this um, marketplace for different stakeholders to find each other or match services. Um, and and we have been we have been doing we've been working on it, but since we since we started, there have been a couple of other companies who have started uh, spinning out similar ideas. Um, so right now we are using the same, the digital platform to support my psychiatric practice. So what I really like about where I am and exciting is that I am a, I'm, I'm a kind of, I would consider our practice is a large practice that supports mental health, mental health care in, in Maryland, which is, which is, leveraging technology so i'm right at the crossroads of technological innovation and mental health tre treatment so i am i'm very very excited for the next 2 to 3 years uh, i mean if we can if we can pilot a project just in maryland and show how effective this portal can be to access care uh, we hope to uh, uh, partner with uh, with an entity that can help us commercialize nationally and, and internationally Nice. Wow. So you pretty much took all your experiences that you've had as a physician and really just understood what's working, what's not working, and identified certain pain points within the industry. And you used your healthcare background to try to transition into creating a solution to these problems, which is how you came up with your company. That's that's correct. Yes. And I, I, I forgot a small part of my life. My, I'm, I'm from a business family. My dad is an entrepreneur. He, he, uh, he was, he was, he, he was born in a very uh, famine-stricken, poor family. So he, he left home very early and created a fortune for himself. You know, he started with a quarter when he left home. Uh, today, he, he is respected in, the, in the community in, 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 where, in, in the, in the place where he lives. So I grew up you know, uh, learning how to manage my store, how to read the cost. So I think the business, the entrepreneur in me always was there. Um, I guess my dad never wanted to be, wanted me to be in business. So he kind of like shaped me into going to medical school. But I think after all these experiences, I, I think this internal part of my uh, entrepreneur side became, I got to jump in. I can see that. I can sense the trend. And I, I think that I, I have been following my gut you know, my intuitions and, and you're right, the pain, it's very simple pain points. And, and I think if you can resolve, and you know, my the success to my practice is very simple. I hired a bunch of doctors, I invested upfront and, and my referral source, if I, if somebody calls me and say, Dr. Krishna, can you take a new patient? If I say yes, they're going to call me again. If they, if I say yes, I'll see them tomorrow. They're going to keep calling me. So you're reliable. Yeah, and 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 the pain point. If I resolve that that practice's pain point, I keep getting business, and I and and it is an access to care for community, right? Uh, uh, access to quality mental health care is, is is very hard nowadays. So you saw a problem within the industry, but there was no solution at the time. So instead of just sitting back and saying, "This is a problem, I'll just deal with it." you went out and figured out a way how to solve that problem. And you created your own platform to not only solve that problem for you, but to help solve that problem for other people, the entire Absolutely. industry, so to say. Absolutely. And what really, this is where I really thought it was very helpful. Uh, my Our group headquarters is right on uh, campus of Towson University and about a few miles from Ho Johns Hopkins Homewood campus. So, you know, I heard from a parent whose who's, uh, kid is attending Johns Hopkins and the mom was from, I think, Indiana. And, and she texted me and said, my son is really going through a difficult time. They cannot, he cannot find a psychiatrist. Can you suggest somebody who can take the insurance and see him immediately? I, I, and I, I kind of followed along and found out when kids end up in school, they have, they, and, and you know, these are kids from all over the world, all over the country, end up in the campus. They, you know, second semester, third semester, they have a problem or the work becomes high or they break up or they have a bad party. 
uh, they go to the counseling center and the counseling center have a very rationed stipulated allocated therapy session so it's six or four after which they will give them a piece of paper and say you got these are the num- these are the numbers of psychiatrists you you can call them and and make an appointment this kid is from indiana he doesn't know he doesn't have a car he doesn't know where is towson where is columbia where, like, he has no idea guess what he's going to do he's going to just throw the toss the paper and and either he's going to drop out or he's going to end up in the emergency room so what i did is i reached out to the counseling center and said hey instead of you giving them numbers why don't you give them my email ask them to email me or text me i will i will i will assure you i'll see him see these kids in a week my god line of contact and kids were so quick to like text or send emails we started seeing you know 20 30 40 clients uh, you know within a short span of time so i found out that you know uh, colleges just like anywhere else have the same problem and if you have a single platform where one can go put their request and the and the technology will find a solution they're quick to adapt they're going to ask for help but it's us who are failing them to provide that access to search through available psychiatrist or therapist or primary care doctors they have to go through google or or they have to go through their insurance card their insurance is from ohio i mean you know it's really cumbersome so my our company's platform mission is to is to improve access to care uh, by onboarding peripheral players and 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 and, and unfortunately you know it, it's uh, everybody loves it but the thing is everybody wants to see how how is the usage how do people use it what is the case situation so uh, i i kind of bootstrapped and decided to support my own practice and and create pilot so that we can show the na- like we can show the naysayers this is how e- how easy it is if you put it on a platform nice so you be- you created the platform for people to be able to find a hospital without having to wait long times or have long patient waiting times and so how are you going about growing this platform and gaining awareness and bringing this solution to the forefront of the people who are facing these problems Yes, well, that's a very good question. I'm glad you asked. Uh, so I, um, I was, I go to these um, uh, meetings, uh, stakeholder meetings, and I, I recently attended a, a meeting for uh, Howard County uh, Recovery Oriented Council, uh, and I met met uh, a CEO there who connected me with the with the policymaker who connected me with a, a regional network called CRISP or Chesapeake Regional information for patient uh, you know it's it's a portal where providers log in to check if patients are getting opioids or they're you know just to check if they're having any duplication in treatment so i uh, reached out to them and we've had meetings since then they have also uh, been solicited by other companies who have similar platforms but similar platform companies are willing to give them the solution but they are not willing to engage the end user or the provider they are not willing to say okay we're going to go find 20 users or 20 psychiatrists who are going to accept the referral right if you have a portal which pushes referral there should be somebody who should be taking it otherwise it won't work so i come along and i say hey you push the pr- referral i will take it because i know from the from the business aspect i am i am friends and in coalition with a couple of large practices who hire doctors and are looking for patients right i i i pay 250 280000 dollars a month for for a year for a psychiatrist i don't want them to sit and watch youtube i want them to be filled so uh, that's a pain point for me so i want robust referral system so i can fill my providers and keep uh, you know keep the business going i know i know i know like 5 to 10 large practices just in the small region of maryland who have the same problem so i i went to crisp and said if i am not able to fill up i will make sure i will form this coalition and fill fill i'm, I'm going to resolve your problem with with me taking it as a provider or 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 forming a coalition with other providers so that any referral you push through this portal we're going to take care of that patient we're going to get care by a provider 
So I think that is what I'm hoping that if I can do that for six months and 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 really uh, scrub the entire Maryland region, I'm going to go to a uh, either a VC or 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 you know early strategic uh, partner like Care First or there are many many people that we think would be very this could be very invaluable uh, and we can show this is what happened in Maryland you know uh, the average wait time to see a psychiatrist dropped you know six months before the launch and six months after and if if I have data I'm pretty sure you know right now with without any of these technological uh, input I'm seeing 2,000 patients uh, 4,000 patients a month so imagine if I can have this easy wow. access that can that can become even more. So imagine the amount of data I can have to show my case to investors, strategic partners, early adopters. I, I hope to I hope to really at least scale up to mid Atlantic in 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 three years and and maybe scale up to the nation if I can align with the right strategic partner. Nice. So right now you're just keeping it within Maryland um, yeah. because okay. you want to test it and make sure it's working and just gather data and get the results so that from there you can go on and scale nationwide or however you want to go about it. Yeah. So pretty much you've created the platform and on one end you have a network of healthcare professionals and physicians who are looking for patients. And yep. then on the other end, you have the stakeholders who have these patients that are experienced long waiting times. So you're kind of providing them that platform yep. to where that they can refer these patients and then whoever, whichever doctor needs patients or has the availability, they can go in and accept them. Correct? Yep. Yep. I'm impressed. That's, that's a very succinct uh, nutshell about absolutely. But, but at the end of the day, it's about helping the patient in the right time, right? If a patient wants to see somebody now, he should, he or she should, should see somebody now and not be put on a wait list for 90 days. So other than just tracking how fast the patient can be seen from the time that they have a problem to the time that they are being able to be seen by a doctor, what other metrics are you tracking as in forms of data to show your results? That you, man, you, you're smart. <laughs> yes. So we, we have ambition to, you know, track, uh, you know, um, readmission you know if, if a patient is you know we can use you we can use this platform in different ways right if 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 Johns Hopkins University Hospital refers 15 patients for us to us through the platform say in a quarter and and if they with, within those cohort if somebody gets readmitted we can go back and look at what happened what was the variable that caused them to have a re, you know readmission or you know lack of response um, we also are, are really like long-term aspirations to engage patients after they get the care. Uh, can we engage them? Can we can we engage them by uh, by uh, you know having a message or, or an app where we can send them out reminders about uh, about their appointments, medications, push out education material about sleep hygiene, nutrition, exercise. You know, simple things that are available on Google. Um, and, and if if you if you can go back to the 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 core tenant of this story, this this twenty forty one year old man who gets cyclically manic during summer, can he be on the platform? Can he be my patient? And I I know John gets manic in spring. Can I have an API with with Fitbit or or, or Apple? And track John's sleep hours because the first indicator for mania is lack of sleep, mm -hmm. you know. And and is there a way to like tap into that and see if John is not sleeping for, you know, for for more than four hours in in you know maybe early March? And I see he has started being awake and, and you know looking up on Tinder or or spending money on Amazon. Like you know these are all metrics we can say. I think you're getting manic. You need to go see Dr. Krishna and maybe Dr. Krishna could be alerted to say your patient, John, uh, seems to be having hypomania. You better bring him soon. So, you know, it's the same concept as diabetes. I, I really love how diabetes is, is, is really evolving. Right. Diabetes have apps that measure your blood glucose and, and sends out information to the patient and saying that, John, your blood glucose was 300 for the last four days. Why? And the same message is sent to the doctor. And the doctor in turn calls John and says, let's push two extra insulin so that you don't end up in the emergency room. 
So the same concept can be applied to bipolar, where we would say in an in instead of lithium instead of uh, um, insulin, we are saying we'll push lithium and bring we bring the patient earlier to mitigate problem so that the patient doesn't get manic and get brought into the emergency room because he thought he was Lord Shiva and he was going to steal the gold from the temple. <laughs> yeah. You know? Can he be unemployed? Can he, can he not be unemployed? Can we mitigate that? So I, I, am, I am really ambitious about those aspects, but at the, at the moment, I want to stay focused on onboarding people, onboarding clients, onboarding uh, stakeholders. And if, if, if they are interested in uh, other lines of services that can help them, I, 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 I have ambitions to um, you know, use these metrics to uh, get analytics on on behavior, sleep, uh, uh, spending. You know, are, are there specific times? You know, bipolar is very impulsive. Spending is very common. You know, uh, yeah. I, I have. I mean, we want to. I have a, one of one of the founders for Blooming Mind is an AI engineer. Pradeep is a is a is a machine learning and AI engineer. So. We are just waiting for our data to become robust so we can start embedding, uh, you know, uh, AI and deep learning into it. Nice. So just to, just to clarify, the platform that you created is just for psychiatric pati- patients? That's correct, yeah. At the moment? And yep. then maybe in the future you could expand? I, so I don't I was, think so. I, I think, you know, behavior health, you know, behavior health, I, I don't want to, like, I think one of the mistakes we do is we really tend to complicate. I think I think I want to stay in that's why the name itself is this blooming mind. We want to box ourselves with, with the mind. Uh, okay. Just focus on one niche, one set yeah. of the market for now. Yep. And so right now you just created a platform to connect people, but ideally you'd want to eventually find a way to track actual data and be able to save that and show it to people whether yep. it's through a medical device like a Fitbit or something that tracks sleep, but eventually you yep. want to create something that allows you to record data from the patients and use it for later on down the road or however you need to use it. Sure. And, and all these, all these are, all these aspirations or things could be, uh, you know, completely will follow standards in you know, the consent CFR 42 compliant, all the all the you know standard policies of security and consent consenting. Yes, uh, uh, obviously John, who struggles from bipolar, has to know that if I get bipolar and there is a possibility I lose my job and my wife and kids, he has to sign up. You know, we we are not. I mean, I I really want to clarify. I'm, we are not going to use data uh, for the sake of data. We are going to use it informally. Uh, in, in an informed way uh, with the patient's consent uh, to help them, you know. Um, no. And there are, there are a lot of apps available. I don't know if you follow, for, you know, uh, Fortune uh, magazine or their blogs, like there are a couple of unicorns in behavior health. Uh, you know, they're all paid. So they're all paid. You know, you have to, you know, I think there's a talk, like you have to pay, you know, $15 per month or whatever. Uh, I I really firmly believe one of my mission is to, not inconvenience the end user, right? So my patients come to me. Uh, my mission is to accept their insurance. They should come to me and say, "This is my insurance card. I want care. What can you do?" We, we will take care of the insurance. You know, reconciling with the insurance. Uh, but affordable care is is another affordable, accessible care, right? You don't want our patients to pay because mental health is a long term. It's a chronic illness. You don't want your patients to pay ten dollars every month for the rest of their life. Yeah. So, so, is it the patient that you're communicating with directly, or is it the insurance companies that are referring the patients to you? We we have both. We have B two B. We have insurance communicate to us to see patients. We have primary care who communicate to us to see patients and patients who are desperate or who are who are in need. You know, look us up and call us. So it's it's all you know B two B B two B two C C to C. You know, like you know. Uh, you know, it's all aspects. We we, we get patients from we referrals from all all sources. Nice. So I think I got a pretty good understanding of you painted a picture for me of the problems that are currently available or the problems that are currently there in the healthcare industry regarding finding rooms for psychiatric patients and finding availability for them. So you went on and created a platform to kind of solve that issue. But I know in 
the process of creating this platform, like you have the experience on the healthcare side and you have somewhat of an entrepreneurship side, but you can't do all of this yourself, right? So can no. you talk more about like the team you've had to put together to help you accomplish this goal? Absolutely. I, I firmly believe in, in I'm, I'm, I was inspired by uh, Warren Buffett's early, early work where, you know, it, it's all about the team, right? It's all about the human resource, human capital. Um, I, 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 I am very quick to make connections, very quick to trust people. I, I believe in like inspiring and, and, and going along. Uh, my wife is the opposite. She deliberates so much that that person leaves. So, <laughs> so we, we are a good match. So yeah, my team, I, I formed a very strong um, uh, team in, in Psych Associates. You know, we have a, we have a, uh, we have an operations director. We have a HR director. We have a, you know, financial director. We, we just created a company wise architecture. We have, you know, we have Barbara. We have Barbara has been with the practice for almost 25 years. Uh, Jan Wilson is the director of human resource at the moment. She's a th- she's a, actually a licensed therapist who's also uh, has a lot of leadership and administrative experience. She used to be working with uh, Magellan, uh, an insurance company, a long time ago. Uh, recently, we have Magna, who's a physician, who's also helping us with operations. Uh, we have Angela, who is a TMS uh, director. Uh, we have Rena Marker, who is the who is the uh, director for call center. We have on team, so we have a, we have a very strong administrative team. So you know, we, we opened up our locations and, and really grew very quickly. But I st- I we slowed down because I think we were we had to get our act together, make our foundation strong. Uh, the, so that's my uh, clinical team. Uh, I had another um, business ma- business. Uh, uh, analyst and a business officer. His name is Bharat. He unfortunately um, uh, took another position due to family reasons. So he was a strong, strong uh, reason why we achieved what we achieved. Um, and then on the on the technology aspect, uh, it's it's Pradeep, who's who's uh, you know who's a family friend and 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 a founder of Bloom in Mind. We have Deepan, who's also a uh, he was also a, a software engineer and an avid programmer. And then we have Dr. Will Carpenter, who is also my very close friend who worked with me through University of Maryland Research and Clinical Care. So that's our team for the technology aspect. You know, Will and myself are clinical experts. Deepan and Pradeep are the technology experts. Uh, Bharat, who used to work with us, was the business analyst and financial projections and help us with, uh, with strategic thinking. Uh, Meghna, Barbara, Jan, Tina, Rena, they're all operations, you know, call center, revenue cycle. There are so many aspects to managing a practice. Uh, wow. And my wife, you know, she's a, she's a strong team. You know, she's a, she's a strength, my, my, my two little kids. So we're all team. Nice. I'm glad you got like a nice little setup, a nice little team, because Obviously, you have your strengths and you have your weaknesses, but in order to succeed, it's like you should focus on your strengths and hire people to handle whatever your weaknesses are and hire experts in that field more specifically. But even in like your process and your journey to creating this platform, whether you have a team or no team, you're going to experience like some setbacks and obstacles or challenges along the way. So can you can you kind of talk about any obstacles that you faced in this process? Yeah, absolutely. I think capital, access to capital um, was the biggest, um, you know, I, I am very intuitive. I do stuff. I mean, I I, I, I talk to my front desk and, and front desk, Dr. Krishna, we cannot take new patients because Dr. XYZ is filled. My intuition is let me go hire a doctor. But I didn't really, didn't really calculate the projections, whether we can afford this doctor. So, uh, we we I quickly grew and, and there were a lot of struggles with access to capital. Uh, I had to work long hours, put all my money into the business, um, and 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 not take a like you know it was boost, literally bootstrapping. Um, and, and then we just got about positive cash flow and bam, this coronavirus just hit me in the face, punched oh. me in the face. Um, but but and 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 you know in the technology aspect everybody loves it but they 
they're all kind of waiting, oh, you're too early, you're too immature, come back when you, when you have five customers and, and $500,000 revenue. If you have $500,000 revenue and five customers, I welcome to you, right? So I'm looking for seed or, or early adopter. So those are the challenges that, that I felt. Uh, so what we did is we, we turned around and said, what do we have right now? We have, ex- we have a lot of providers who can see patients. Um, and and use that use that leverage. You know, we we need we need technological ad, ad, advances in our practice. So we we are we are slowly going to tell everybody don't call us, use this portal to refer patients. So we're going to make all the other people who refer to us start using this portal and onboard them very gradually, and and eventually they'll start using it on their own and not call us. Uh, you know, then they they are passively recruited into the onboarding process. Uh, uh, the other challenges, um, yeah, I think, I think largest has been, um, I, th- I think, uh, mentoring. I think I, I, I did not, uh, I didn't really um, uh, understand the, the the complexities of human managing human resource and 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 running a company without projections and 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 looking at financials that that is something that i still struggle out of business aspect yeah gotcha. um so we're now coming up towards the end of the podcast sure. and i like to end the podcast with a little more fun exercise we've been talking about more serious stuff so kind of have a couple questions for our rapid fire round i just want to ask you it doesn't necessarily have to be related to healthcare. it can and cannot um it's just a couple questions to end the, the podcast on a cool note Sure. So, question number one: What is your favorite book of all time? Yeah, I uh, I think uh, my favorite book is uh, a book called as Freedom at Midnight." Um, it uh, was a book written by two uh, uh, very nice, uh, very good authors, Dominic Lapierre and uh, um, Larry Collins. Uh, it was about Indian independence. So we had been taught about India's independence through the books of India. But I learned about how India got independence through this book called as Freedom at Midnight. That that's by far the most boring topic. I could not drop the book because that these authors made it such a thrilling. Uh, I felt like I was there in in that in that during the time of freedom of India. Nice, painted a cool story. Yeah. Um, what is one goal that you want to accomplish this year? Ah. Uh, I, I really want to. Um, um, I want to set. I want to set a uh, strategic, uh, you know, two-year goal for both the companies. Um, I really want to um, uh, uh, spend time on myself, my mental health, and my my health, so that I could be a more effective leader and an effective um, um, effective uh, manager. Uh, I think I've been running so much. I need to slow down and take care of myself as well. Gotcha. So last one. What is the one piece of advice that you would give to your 20-year-old self? Uh, uh, Patience. I I think Uh I've always been internally restless. So I I would tell myself, be patient. Awesome. Well, I appreciate you coming on this podcast. I definitely learned a lot about what you're doing and how you're solving the whole patient wait times and how you created a platform and a marketplace to connect these patients with referring or with doctors who can take them on immediately and just kind of understanding your journey as not only a healthcare professional, but a business owner as well and the ups and downs that you face and the different pieces of the puzzle that you have to put together in order to make this thing come alive. And so I found this very valuable. I just want to thank you for Hopping on, is there anything else you'd like to share? Where can people find you at? No, thanks for inviting me. Um, you know, I, I think LinkedIn, LinkedIn people can find me on LinkedIn. Um, unfortunately, no, I'm not on Facebook or Twitter or on none of those social platforms. Um, I, I think they can they can uh, find me on my website and, and connect with me, but, but LinkedIn is the only social media I'm doing at the moment. <laughs> awesome. Well, other than that, that concludes today's episode. Thanks for coming, Ethan. Thank you so much. You have a wonderful day and stay safe. And hopefully we will all look back and this will be a nightmare in the back in the back mirror.
<laughs> Definitely. Thanks for listening to today's episode of Health Tech Hustle with Rodney Hu, founder of 209 Digital. Tune in next week for another interview with an expert leader in digital health.